Good afternoon, and welcome to Inside the Middle East Question and Answer Series here at the Middle East Initiative at Harvard University. My name is Kevin Moss, and I'm a first-year master's candidate in the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. With me today is Ambassador Robert Ford. Robert Ford is former ambassador to Syria from 2011 to 2014 and former ambassador to Algeria from 2006 to 2008. Ambassador Ford received the Presidential Honor Award for Outstanding Service at the American Embassy in Damascus and the State Department's highest award of State's Distinguished Service. He is currently a scholar at the Middle East Initiative at Johns Hopkins University. Ambassador Ford, thank you for your time today. It's nice to be with you, Kevin. How are you? I'm doing great. Good. Let me start by asking, why did you resign from your ambassadorship in Syria? You know, I had a great run. I was in the Peace Corps and in the State Department for 30 years, um, and I enjoyed it a lot. But in the end, the Syria policy caused me a lot of personal difficulties. I liked what we were hoping to achieve, that is to say, a political settlement to the Syria crisis, but we weren't doing the things necessary to reach that political settlement. And in the end, I could no longer defend the administration's decisions on Syria policy. It was beginning to touch on my personal integrity. I couldn't have that, so I had to go. Mm. Do you think that the United States is helping the Assad regime by targeting ISIS targets in Syria? I don't think that's what they intended to do. I really don't. Uh, but the way they're doing the targeting right now, uh, late October, where they're hitting Islamic State targets in eastern Syria, where they're confronting the regime, um, but not hitting Islamic State targets where the moderate opposition is fighting the Islamic State. That selectiveness um, is actually relieving pressure on the Assad regime in places like Deir Azor, where there's a real battle going on between Assad and the Islamic State. So hitting the Islamic State there helps the regime. Uh, they're not doing anything to help the moderates on the other side. Do you believe a political resolution is attainable without Geneva II? Oh, Kevin, I think it's going to be really hard to get to Geneva II anytime soon. I was at Geneva I, and we got no traction at all with the Syrian regime. The opposition put forward a very reasonable proposal uh, last February, that is to say eight months ago. Uh, didn't even ask for Assad to step down as a precondition, um, and the regime refused, point blank to negotiate it. They came to Geneva but had no intention of negotiating and the Russians did not put any pressure on them. So now when we think about going back to a peace negotiation, I think until the Syrian regime in Damascus is starting to feel some real pressure, uh, I don't think they're going to negotiate anything. So how do you envision Syria's political future? Right now it's quite bleak. Right now it's quite, quite bleak. Uh, there's a civil war going on, obviously. Uh, it's complicated, but it's not that complicated. I think of it really as a four-way civil war where one of the four sides is the Syrian regime, the Assad regime. One of the sides is the Islamic State. One of the sides is what I call the moderate armed opposition. And the last side is the Al-Qaeda-linked Nusra Front, uh, which sometimes works with the moderate opposition and sometimes fights it. Right now they're fighting up in northwest Syria, for example, October 30th, they're fighting. Can you speak to the international influence and forces in Syria, support for the SNC from Qatar and Saudi Arabia? And yeah, sure. Other actors? Well, the, the Saudis and the Qataris and others, Turkey, very important, uh, Europeans, some of the European countries, United Arab Emirates, Jordan, um, are giving a lot of political support to the Syrian political opposition. Uh, most of that political opposition is in Turkey. It's headquartered in Istanbul. My own sense of it, Kevin, is that with time, this basically expatriate opposition that has been in Turkey now for years is growing less and less influential on the ground. The people on the ground in Syria who are doing the fighting and who are suffering, suffering the cold, suffering the barrel bombs, etc. I think are less and less inclined to take any kind of political guidance from this expatriate opposition based in Istanbul, and that also is a problem. Do you think that the Syrian opposition will be receptive to a separate Alawite 
government-led government? It's a good question, and it would have been interesting to see how a negotiation in Geneva last February would have played out. What I can say is that the armed groups sometimes talk a good game and say they are not sectarian, they believe in uh, Syria for everyone, um, but some of them are pretty sectarian. And so as we think, we the Americans and the coalition that we lead of countries in the region, as we think about increasing assistance to the Free Syrian Army, to the moderate opposition, I think there has to be a quid pro quo. We will increase assistance, but only in return for those armed groups reaching out to disaffected elements of the regime, and those are basically Alawis, who are tired of the fighting, they're taking heavy casualties, and they are looking for a third way out. Neither Assad nor the Islamic State. So the people we want to support, I think, have to reach out to those Alawis. You mentioned in your op-ed in the New York Times that the Free Syrian Army um, is not full of angels. No, it's um, certainly not. Then how would you envision their leadership? Well, they already have a leadership. Um, there are roughly, oh, maybe 15 to 20 major groups. Um, sometimes in the press you'll see 1,500 groups, but most of those are very small and insignificant. It's half a dozen guys with two rifles and a video camera, and they call themselves a battalion. The really serious groups that have hundreds and thousands of fighters on the ground, I think you could count on, I don't know, both hands and a foot, maybe both feet. So they already have leaders. In many cases, they're senior officers, colonels, lieutenant colonels who defected um, and have been in the field fighting for the last couple of years. Uh, in some cases, there are people with previous military experience who then finished their military time and went into business or trade. A lot of the groups are led by people like that. Um, I don't think that leadership will change, but there is something we need to work on in order to put more pressure on the Syrian regime and get back to a negotiating table. The command structure of the moderate opposition needs to be unified. The multiplicity of sources of material assistance into the armed groups is actually aggravating the disunity problem. A group receives, say, money and weapons from Saudi Arabia. They're not going to pay attention to some general over there, senior commander, who says, we need you to move over 20 miles down the road. They're going to say, no, we like it here, and we're getting our stuff from the Saudis, and we don't have to pay attention to you. So we, Saudis, Turks, everybody who's giving material assistance to that opposition, to that moderate armed opposition, has to agree on a unified Syrian chain of command. And the assistance needs to flow through that unified Syrian chain of command so that it can enforce discipline and enforce command and control on the various units in the field. We have never had that in three years of this conflict. Great. Thank you, Ambassador Ford, for your time. My pleasure. And your comments and your insights. Thank you. My pleasure, Kevin. I look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, me too. Take care.